So I have a little motto, and the motto is, the goal is to live your life. It's not to be comfortable. If you're living a comfortable life, of course we want to be comfortable, but the way we grow is by doing things that are uncomfortable. Your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. This is the Building Psychological Strength Podcast, where we explore ways to build resilience, build confidence, and make our minds work in our favor. We draw from the fields of psychology and life design to help us intentionally create a rock-solid mindset upon which a vibrant life experience can be built. My name is April Seifert. I'm a psychologist, a life design strategist, and co-founder of Peak Mind, the Center for Psychological Strength. Each week, I'll introduce you to an expert, a concept, a technique, or a hands-on practice that will help you build psychological strength in your own life. These are the tools to help you thrive. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Building Psychological Strength podcast. My name is April Seifert, and I'm your host. This week, we have a serious powerhouse on the podcast, and I'm really excited for you all to listen to this episode. Here's why. Occasionally, we have someone come on the podcast. You know, every guest always provides a lot of value, but there's some, you know, certain people who come on and they provide just tip after tip after tip and technique after technique and their way of explaining concepts that are really difficult is just so concise and so clear. And that's what's happening this week. This week, you are going to get to hear from a man named Ken Goodman. He is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California, and he focuses on treating anxiety disorders and OCD. Now think about this from the perspective of how it relates to you. There are things called anxiety disorders where people's level of anxiety, either general or specific about a particular situation or topic or set of things, reaches a level that it is impairing their life. That's the time when people, you know, come and see Ken. They come and see him in a therapeutic way, and he takes them through more of a traditional therapy approach. But, and P.S., that's like 18% of people in the world, almost one in five, reach clinical levels of having a de- having an anxiety disorder. Now think about how many people, though, who are not in that 18% still suffer from feelings of anxiety and other related effects that just don't reach that clinical level that lead them to go see someone like Ken. Think about how many people that is. I would dare to say that is 100% of people out there. I mean, 100% of people have anxious feelings from time to time. So what makes this episode so powerful is Ken has a beautifully concise and clear way of helping us understand what anxiety is, the true root cause of it. He does such a good job of concisely explaining that in such a clear way. He does a beautiful job of explaining the positive role that feelings of anxiety play in the ability to reduce feelings of anxiety. I know that sounded crazy and it sounded like I made a mistake, but for real, he talks about how feeling anxious is actually a good thing when you're trying to reduce anxiety totally crazy. You're going to love it. He also gives so many actionable tips on what you can do in your own life to identify the areas that you might be anxious and begin to make improvements in them. He's also got an upcoming webinar that I want to let you guys know about. He talks about it during the episode too, but it's on December 7th. He's going to be focusing on health-related anxiety. Um, Head over to ADAA.org, and here you can find the registration for this webinar. It's on December 7th. Again, even if you can't make it at that time, he let me know after we recorded this that if you sign up, you're going to get a replay. So they want to make sure that people get this content and are able to get the help they need if this is something that they're struggling with. So it's going to be a really powerful webinar. Ken is, speaking of the ADAA, Ken is a board member of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. So he's really one of those people who is 
on the forefront of treating anxiety and depression, two of the most common, common, common um, issues that people suffer from. And so many more people than that, even you know, if you take into account uh, people who don't reach a clinical level. So this episode is so wonderful. We're so appreciative of Ken for taking some time to come and share his expertise and all of this actionable information with us. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Ken, I'm really excited to have you on this episode of the podcast because you have expertise in an area that impacts so many people. So thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do and in particular, um, the areas that you specialize in within the field. So I treat anxiety disorders and OCD. So all types of anxiety from people who experience trauma to people who have fears and phobias, including fears of driving, fears of vomiting, uh, fears of uh, getting their blood pressure taken, as well as anyone who has any sort of generalized anxiety. So all types of fears and phobias, children, teens, adults. And then I also produce uh, self-help material for people with anxiety. Um, including a coloring self-help book, an audio program for people who prefer to listen rather than read, as well as relaxation exercises. So I try to provide the whole gamut of treatment. I do workshops for for people who suffer, and uh, it's great. I take my patients who have uh, you know fears of getting out of their comfort zone, and we go places that are uncomfortable, and uh, it's great. It's a it's a very rewarding and a satisfying profession and and fabulous helping people out. Here's what's really cool about that is so much of what we talk about within the field of psychology and definitely within Peak Mind is that a lot of these things, a lot of, you know, anxiety for sure, they occur on a continuum, right? There's um, very... Uh, maybe slight feelings of anxiety up to something that is very debilitating and impacts, you know, nearly every waking moment of your life and what you do and where you'll go and, you know, things that you might accomplish. Um, Along that continuum, though, it sounds like you have expertise in, you know, helping people who might be anywhere from, you know, that, that, you know, one side where this isn't debilitating, but it is definitely something that they're experiencing throughout their lives up to somebody who might be completely stopped in their tracks due to anxiety and other related things. Yeah. Most people will not come to me unless it's really impacting their life. They are coming to me because they are suffering in some way. They are impaired in some way. They're avoiding a lot of things. Um, they're doing a lot of compulsions. It's, you know, usually I'm not getting someone who has a simple phobia that they're getting around. Like, for instance, one of the most common phobias I treat is the fear of driving. Why? Because I live in Los Angeles with an inefficient transit system. So people can't get around unless they can drive. So I get a lot of that. But if you live in Manhattan, therapists there might not get that because people can go on the subway. But I also get people who are afraid to get on things that might cause them to feel trapped, like a subway. So, you know, but if you have a fear of dogs, you probably wouldn't come see me because you'll just avoid dogs. So if you can avoid things and go about your life, probably won't seek treatment. But if it starts to impinge on your life, usually people will come and see me at that point. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in diving into uh, is those people who might not come and see you. But they are people who are still experiencing symptoms of anxiety or to some degree are experiencing anxiety. So what I've found, and this is just, you know, just in my um, perception of folks around me and people who reach out through our website, anxiety is so common and so pervasive that people almost think that it's normal. Like it's normal to feel like this. It's normal to have thoughts like these. It's normal to feel anxious about something that might happen in the future or something that happened in the past. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because these are folks who are likely under that threshold that you mentioned where they aren't at the point where their life is completely impaired, but they're still having thoughts and feelings that are associated with anxiety that... um, are still causing them some discomfort day to day. 
Absolutely. Those people are functioning, they're doing fine, but and they're living with some degree of worry or anxiety that, you know, maybe pops up now and then, or maybe there's a kind of a steady flow in the you know, throughout the day. But they function, they do okay. And but those people can really get help. They, it doesn't have to be that way. But they have to make a concerted effort to to get help and to and to actually use the tools and the strategies that I teach that we'll we'll probably talk about today to help them even if they're not at that point where they're kind of in a desperate state. So maybe we can start with I always love starting at a very foundational place and that is from the place of recognizing. What are some of the things, I mean, let's just shine a bright light on that dark corner that people might be walking around thinking, maybe not even recognizing some of the symptoms that you as a clinician, you as somebody who's an expert in the field would classify as, oh yeah, that <laughs> that thing you're describing, that's that's pretty much a symptom of anxiety. When, you're, when your mind does that, that's what that means. Um, can you give us sort of a laundry list of what those would be, again, from that perspective of we're not at the point where you're not leaving your house. You know, it's not that debilitating, but the right. symptoms that somebody just in their day-to-day -day life would experience that they might not even realize that they are anxiety. By the way, it's not uncommon to have a patient come into my office and they're, let's say, in their 40s or their 50s, and for the first time in their life, it's really taken hold and they're debilitating and then we talk about well have you experienced this before no but when I really think back at it I have been anxious quite a bit through my life but it just wasn't at that point where it became a problem and so it can kind of you know be at that level for a while so one of those some of those um, signs and symptoms might be let's just begin with physical symptoms so if you experience any sort of physical symptoms uh, of anxiety, which might include anything to do with like your breath. You feel like you can't get enough breath. Maybe your heart is racing. Maybe there's pressure in your chest. There's some sort of abdominal issues. Anxiety is a way of affecting the stomach. So people might get some gastro issues. They may have to go to the bathroom a lot. Um, uh, they feel the butterflies in their stomach. There could be just a low level of um, shaking or just feeling um, just jittery. They might have other symptoms of lightheadedness, perhaps. Um, maybe they will feel like sweaty. So these are just some of the many physical symptoms that people might get. But it also might come in the form of worry. They're just worrying a lot. They're just worrying, what if this, what if that? Everywhere they go or many places where they go, they imagine worst case scenarios. Maybe they worry about health. Maybe they worry about loved ones dying. But there's a general sense that they're just worrying a lot. There's a feeling that, you know, something bad might happen. There might be avoidance. So it might affect your behavior. So it can affect you physically with symptoms. It can affect you with um, your thoughts. But it can affect you behaviorally. So if you notice that you're avoiding things, why are you avoiding things? Because maybe you're too scared to do it. You're too anxious to do it. So those are kind of some of the signs that people might have anxiety. One of them that I always think is interesting to point out, and this is a very specific time point, but it's one of those times that I think is interesting to talk to people about because it's one where people think, oh yeah, this is really normal. Um, the one that I typically point at is uh, this Sunday evenings this sense of dread and sense of worry about the week ahead and whether you're going to be able to handle it and all of that, it's almost become so commonplace for people to feel those feelings. And yes, if that's the only time you're feeling it, you know, you've got this very specific time point that, you know, you're struggling with. But if you think about how you feel in time points like that, and that's starting to happen in other times, other, you know, days of the week, that type of thing. It tends to be something that people can resonate with. And it's funny because, you know, 
channels like HGTV have picked up on this. And if you watch HGTV on Sunday evenings, they air shows like Island Life and Hawaii Hunters and all these things about these people going on vacations to tropical islands to buy houses. And it's just this way to mentally dissociate from the reality of the fact that your week is coming up and you're probably feeling anxious about everything that's coming up ahead and kind of ruminating on it a little bit. It's this way to just sort of distract yourself and think, look at me, I'm going to buy a house on an island. So I always think it's interesting that it gets so pervasive, people don't realize just how commonplace it is. Oh, yeah, it's very common. You know, I'm working with a girl right now who is very anxious to go to school, and she typically misses Mondays. She skips out on Mondays because she's so anxious. It's the transition from having a very relaxed and fun weekend to now I have to get down to business. And just that transition can be really difficult for people. Absolutely. You know, 18% of the adult population suffers with an anxiety disorder. That's almost one in five. And that's just with the disorder. So probably way higher for just general anxiety. But remember, anxiety is normal. Everyone experiences anxiety. Even, I mean, I experienced anxiety um, just two months ago. I was in Israel and I was at a tourist site it was a tourist site where you can walk through a tunnel. And it was a tunnel in the old city of Jerusalem. It went from outside the city to inside the city. It was a water tunnel back in the day. It was meant to bring water from outside the city to inside the city, but now it's a tourist attraction you can actually walk through. The tunnel is about two feet wide, and it's about a third of a mile. So it takes maybe 20 minutes to walk through, at least pitch black with water, you know, maybe a few inches high, maybe five inches high. And they tell you, if you have claustrophobia, don't go in there. And so I started thinking, like, could I get anxious if I go in there? Like, would I start to get anxious? I'm kind of envisioning me with a bunch of people in front of me and a bunch of people behind me, and I'm feeling anxious and I can't get out. So I started to feel some anxiety just about that. And then I thought, you know, I ask my patients to do hard things all the time. Screw it. I'm doing it. I'm mm. going in. And, I, and then from that moment forward, I just stopped worrying about it. I just went in. And I actually had a great time. It was fun in there. We had our little flashlights. It was, it was pitch black, which probably helped. I couldn't see. Um, it was a great – I had a great time. And actually the woman behind me said that – she actually suffered with claustrophobia at one point. So, you know, I congratulated her. Hey, you, you're you in this tunnel and you once had claustrophobia. That is fantastic because that's not something you have to do. That was completely voluntary, you know. So that was a great experience for me that I it's all so much of anxiety is anticipation. It's believing what your imagination is telling you. And what my imagination was telling me was. I could have a panic attack in there. I could get super anxious and be trapped. But that didn't even happen at all. It wasn't even close to that. It was actually fun. That's an amazing example. I love that. I'm wondering, it brings up uh, another question. We spoke about this a little bit before we hopped on to record. And that was around um, this notion of doing things that make us feel uncomfortable or doing things that are hard or, you know, to your point, doing things that we feel anxious about and intentionally doing them anyway. And you mentioned, you know, you take people who feel uncomfortable and you make them go do things that feel uncomfortable. Talk to me about why that works. Like, what's up with that? Why is it that, you know, putting yourself in that position that makes you feel anxious and that you're not comfortable with, why is it that that helps quell some of that and, and reduce that anxiety that we're feeling by putting yourself intentionally in those situations? So I have a little motto, and the motto is, the goal is to live your life. It's not to be comfortable. If you're living a comfortable life, of course we want to be comfortable, but the way we grow is by doing things that are uncomfortable. And that could be with anything. So for instance, if... I, if someone has social anxiety, they're anxious in social situations, but they really want to take a photography class, well, that means they're going to be around people. So they can either not do it 
and choose to be comfortable and watch Netflix at night, or they can go to the weekly class, take, learn about photography, meet people, be uncomfortable, and then after about 10 weeks, not only are they going to know how to take pictures, but they're going to actually be comfortable in the class with other people. So in order to get to the comfortable part, you have to go through the uncomfortable part first. You have to accept and tolerate that discomfort in order to get to the comfortable part of whatever you're doing. How do people do that? I would love, like, keep going, but, like, keep going even further. Like, we have to endure that. And then I would love coming from someone, again, with expertise in this area. How do we do that? So I'll give you an example. So many years ago, I wanted to learn how to rollerblade. Well, I'm, you know, I was not good at things that required balance. I played basketball and soccer. For me to go on rollerblades was going to be uncomfortable. But I knew, I knew that going in. And I was risking falling, hurting myself, embarrassing myself. And I knew that. And I knew that it was going to take time. So, you know, I went out there and was awkward and uncomfortable, but accepted it and just focused on what the instructor was saying, this is what you have to do, and focusing on that. And I knew if I just kept doing it over and over and over, eventually I'd be comfortable, which is what happened. But when people have anxiety, they have an intolerance of discomfort. It's one of the root, it's one of the two roots of all anxiety disorders. You can't tolerate discomfort. As soon as you feel discomfort, you back away, you avoid. The other root of all anxiety disorders is an intolerance of uncertainty. You feel uncertain, you can't tolerate that uncertainty, and so you don't engage. So when you have both of them, uncertainty and discomfort, there's usually avoidance. So what you need to do is learn how to tolerate that discomfort and tolerate the uncertainty and seek those opportunities. But you have to have a certain mindset. When you do that, you can't just walk into anxiety's territory and expect that it's going to be okay unless you have a certain mindset. So what is, you mentioned that people have to have a particular mindset. Tell us a little bit about that because I think that would help people um, get in the right mindset of understanding how they can start to do some of these difficult things. So it's not good enough to expose yourself to what you're afraid of, to face your fears. You have to do it in a certain way. So for instance, I have patients with a fear of driving and yet they drive their child to and from school every day. Well, you would think, well, after a while, they would get used to that and they would be okay with that. But not necessarily, because if they get in the car and they're gripping the steering wheel and they're praying that they don't crash or they're praying they don't have a panic attack, all they're doing is strengthening their anxiety. They're making it worse. They're rehearsing. They're practicing being anxious. So you have to step into anxiety's territory and do things uncomfortable with a different mindset. You have to face your fears with what I call a game face. Now what's a game face? Game face is basically taken from the world of sports where you are entering the, the, the arena, the field, the court with your game face on. It's a determination to win. Like I'm facing my opponent, in this case anxiety, with the determination to win even though I have doubt, because anxiety is not going to let you be confident. It's, you're stepping into an uncertain situation, so you're always going to have doubt. So like, fine, I have doubt, but I'm going to put my game face on anyways, accept the uncertainty and the discomfort. In fact, I'm going to go one step further and want it. I want to be uncomfortable. I want to be uncertain. I have to want what I don't want. Why? Because it's going to be there anyways. You're going to be uncomfortable and anxious anyways. You might as well just want it. Like, give it to me. I'm going to do this anyways. This is my practice. I have to practice facing this with my game face on and doing it over and over and over until it becomes comfortable. I love that. That so hits on um, the reason why we call this podcast Building Psychological Strength, right? It's a it's draws from this notion of becoming physically stronger through 
repeating an exercise. You can't just go lift weights one time and think that you're you know, going to become physically strong. It's something that you have to do over and over and over again and continue to up the amount of weight that you're lifting. And it sounds like this is very similar where it's a practice that you're going to take on. You're going to do it over and over again, but I'm guessing when you get comfortable, when you finally do get to that point where you're comfortable, your game face worked, you the mindset worked, you're at a place where you could do something you couldn't do before, I'm guessing you're asking people to up their game and do a little bit more after that and get uncomfortable again. Oh, absolutely. You are literally rewiring your anxious brain to become eventually calm. But, you know, it takes a while to rewire your brain. I mean, think about you know, learning a language or learning how to type. It just doesn't happen overnight. You got to do it over and over and over. And it helps if you have that right mindset. So if you, let's say, have a fear of closed spaces, your fear of getting into elevators, let's say. Well, in order to get over the fear of elevators, you actually have to go in the elevator at some point. So you're going to feel anxious. There's nothing you can do to stop that. You're going to feel anxious. So, all right, fine, I'm going to feel anxious. Now I'm going to learn some tools to kind of help myself through it. So bring on the anxiety. I can handle it. And when you feel anxious, good, this is exactly the feeling I need. Now, why is it exactly the feeling you need? Because in order to get over the fear of elevators, I have to experience the fear first. I got to go into my anxiety to get out. I remember um, many years ago, I was working with a guy... Uh, he was a pilot, and he had OCD. Now, his OCD had nothing to do with being a pilot. It had to do with health, had health anxiety. Oh, by the way, I'm doing a webinar on health anxiety on December 7th through the Anxiety and Depression Association of America at 10 o'clock Pacific time. So you, have to, you can sign up ahead of time. Go to adaa.org and sign up. It's a webinar, and it'll actually include someone who has, who overcame health anxiety. So it'll be a great webinar. Anyway, so he had, a, um, he, was, he remembered that when he was training to be a pilot, he was up in the air, he was doing very well, his instructor was right next to him, and his instructor said to him, you're doing great, now you need to fly, now you need to learn how to fly in turbulence. And he was, no, I don't want to fly in turbulence, that's scary. But to be a pilot, you have to fly in turbulence. So they looked for areas of the sky that were traditionally windy, flow, flew to them and through them, and then did it over and over and over. And now he loves flying in turbulence. It's his favorite thing to do. So make sure you don't get on a plane with him as the pilot. <laughs> He's like, we're just going to hang out here because I'm having a good time. I'm not going to bring us up another 5,000 feet where it's a little bit smoother. No, thanks. Right. <laughs> we'll stay here. Um, well, that's an example of like, okay, in order to overcome my fear of turbulence, I have to practice being in turbulence. Yeah. It sounds so similar to uh, m recently I interviewed a woman named Arielle uh, Garten, I think was her last name. Um a better podcast host would know the exact uh, number. 147. Yeah, Arielle Garten. And she is a meditation and mindfulness expert. She developed this uh, EEG sensing headband that helps you meditate and keep track of what your mind is doing while you're doing it. And it's interesting because I think a lot of people get... Um, get it wrong with meditation and the practice of it because they think that you're doing it wrong if you start to have thoughts and that's not the case you you actually sort of want thoughts to happen while you're meditating because the practice comes in recognizing the thoughts and then bringing your mind back to conscious awareness so if you didn't have any thoughts there would be no practice there it sounds so similar to what you're saying about anxiety where you actually, yes, anxiety doesn't feel good, but you need it to happen in order to overcome it. There's no practice there if you don't actually have the thing that you're trying to get rid of. If it doesn't actually happen, you're not practicing. It's just such an interesting analog. That is 100%. Think about this. If you want to learn how to put out a fire, an instructor or someone has to light a fire first. 
So the instructor lights a fire, and then you put it out. And then the instructor lights a bigger fire, and you put that out. And then the instructor lights a different kind of fire, like an electrical fire, and you put that out. So the only way to learn how to put out a fire is for someone to light one first. So it's, it's similar with anxiety. The only way you're going to get better at handling physical symptoms of anxiety is to actually have physical symptoms. Or the only way to get better at handling anxious thoughts is to have anxious thoughts. So if you look at it, it's like, okay, cool, this is my opportunity to practice. This is my opportunity to practice dealing with it, as opposed to, no, I don't want this. I want to go to the flip side. What happens if you don't? Let's say you are a person who tends to get anxious, tends to be anxious, maybe in a particular domain. Um, if you don't push that comfort zone, is it possible for it to shrink do you know what I'm asking? Like, instead of expanding your comfort zone in the way that we just talked about and making yourself feel more comfortable doing a wider variety of things that are more um, advanced than what you could do in the past, what if you don't? Is it possible for that to, I don't know what the right word is, atrophy? If you're like most people, your mind isn't always your biggest cheerleader. Do any of these thoughts sound familiar? Ugh, people like you can't do things like that. Come on, who do you think you are? Do you really think you'll be able to keep it up even if you do succeed at first? Our minds send us a constant stream of thoughts throughout the day and not all of them are helpful or even true. In reality, a good chunk of those thoughts are mental habits or assumptions that formed long ago and they don't do us any favors, especially when we're trying to go after something big. These thoughts are self-limiting beliefs, and unfortunately, they're way too common. If you've ever experienced self-limiting beliefs, we've got the free webinar for you. In mid-December, Peak Mind will be hosting an absolutely free live webinar focused on helping you understand where those self-limiting beliefs come from and why they're so influential over you. We'll dig deep into the science of identity and we'll help you spot those beliefs and see them for what they are, a set of unhelpful assumptions that you don't have to follow. Head over to peakmindpsychology.com backslash webinar to register. Imagine what your life would feel like if you didn't have those thoughts and beliefs holding you back. How big of a goal would you set? How much more confident would you be? What do you think you could accomplish? Join us live and absolutely free. Registration is required, so head over to peakmindpsychology.com backslash webinar to sign up. Your limitless future starts now. We can't wait to see you there. Well, I think in order to expand your comfort zone, you actually have to take steps. Like, you know, you have to actually take steps into what you're uncomfortable with. Now, is it possible to for your anxiety about a certain situation to go away first before you take those steps it's possible because so much of what anxiety is about is your imagination is what you're imagining something to be and so if at some point you start to realize like nah that's not right and then you're then immediately you're you're less anxious about it and then you can step into anxiety's territory and be okay like friend, let me let me just ask you a question. Let's say we were in the same city, and you were going to come see me, and you came to my office building and you parked your car, and right out front of the building there was a man dressed in a chicken costume, and he <laughs> said to you, "Yeah, picture that." He said to you, "Don't go in the building. Sometime in the next hour, a meteor is going to hit this building." So what would you do? I'd probably go in the building and then text people and tell them how I saw this crazy man in a chicken costume. <laughs> right. So then you'd sit down and, and you'd be meeting with me. You'd sit down and would you be anxious? Uh, no, unlikely. Would you not be anxious? Um, I mean, I think having seen that, it just puts you in this like weird mood of seeing a person dressed up like a chicken um, for sure. So uh, maybe just the distraction of this crazy person who is dressed up in a costume would. Okay. So what you're saying is a crazy person dressed in, the, in a costume. I don't believe him. So if you don't believe the lie in your imagination, you tend not to get anxious. But if you believe what's going on in your imagination, you're going to get anxious. So it's not what's real. 
It's what you believe. It's your perception. That's, that's good. All, all of what anxiety is, you know, you know, people have anxieties about all sorts of things. What they're doing is they're perceiving something that's not true. So it's a protective mechanism. It's there to protect us. So people will go through all sorts of lengths. If you have fears of germs, maybe you won't use a public restroom because you perceive that the germs are somehow going to cause you to be ill, right? Or, you know, so you'll avoid, or maybe, you know, you'll have, you'll hold it for hours at a time. So you don't go on a public restroom. So, you know, people have these beliefs about things that just are not true. I'll give you an example. I had a patient some years ago and, um, she was in her 40s, and she, after a few months in therapy, she shared a secret that she never told anyone. As a child, maybe around 8, 9, or 10, she was looking in the mirror, and she was looking at her tongue, and she had this thought that her tongue was too big. And she started to think about that, and she worried that maybe kids would see her big tongue, and they would make fun of her. So she stopped talking a lot to, to her peers and she wondered if she would talk and trip over her tongue and stutter so she limited her speech and then she started wondering if she could swallow her tongue and it would get stuck so she never told anyone about this she just worried about it and it was afraid and it changed her behavior she became more shy and this continued through her whole life until she shared with me what the what her this is what her imagination told her, and she just it was it kept repeating so often that she just believed it, and then I finally just said to her, "Well, stick out your tongue, let me see," and she stuck it out. It was, it was a normal sized tongue, <laughs> <laughs> and so but you know so we worked on that, and you know she stopped believing that her tongue was too big, and you, it enabled her to be more open with people and talk to people and things like that. But it was all this this a lie in her imagination that she just accepted and it affected her her teenage years or childhood or adult years and it's sad so and for anybody listening to this who's like okay this person thought their tongue was really big like that is you know that's one thing any uh, her tongue anxiety is your anxiety about uh, public speaking or talking to new people who you don't know or going to movies or out to eat by yourself because people might judge you or any number of other things that would limit what you would want to do day to day or in your life. So or, her or tongue thing. Right, exactly. Just traveling and having to walk, go through the TSA line. You know, I'm anxious about going through the TSA line. Just any little thing. That's causing you some anxiety. Right. So her tongue thing is your whatever your thing is. Um, we've got an expert here on the line on this episode. What are a few things that people can do to start pushing those boundaries? Like to put them in a place where they can start to do some of these difficult things. You talked about game face. Um, give people some just practical, like if you were going to dictate what people go do later on today, after they've heard this episode, to start working on an area that they might feel some anxiety in, what would you have them go do? So first, it's identifying what that thing might be. And then it's understanding that at the root of it is an intolerance of discomfort and uncertainty. Like, okay, I, it's hard for me to tolerate these things. Now, some people might do them anyway. So some people might have anxiety about giving speeches, but they give them anyways. Or some people have uh, anxiety about driving, but they do it anyways. They kind of suffer through it. So we need to begin to identify what thoughts are you having? You might want to write those down. Like, what thoughts do I have about this particular thing? Because it's not, it's, you know, it's your content. Someone else's content is different. But what's, what are your thoughts about your content. So for instance, if it's public speaking or staying in the TSA line, what am I actually anxious about? And so I would write it out. What if the TSA, TSA person stops me and frisks me? <laughs> or, you know, what if I'm 
late for my plane. I mean, whatever it happens to be, write all those worrisome thoughts out. Write them all out as specifically as you can. That would be the first step. And then change it so that you're writing it in the second person. So it, let's say, for instance, um, you're worried about being late for the plane. So you would write, um, your initial th thought would be, what if I'm late for the plane? But now you're going to change in the second person. It's going to be, what if you're late for the plane? So now I'm going to have anxiety talking to you. Anxiety is going to be talking to you, and anxiety is going to be saying to you, what if you're late for the plane? What if you miss your flight? What if you give the speech and you mess up? What if you turn red? What if people laugh at you? So now you're writing it in the second person as if anxiety is talking to you. So now let's look at it like a mental game where anxiety is saying these things to you and trying to punk you, trying to push you around, lie to you, trying to get you to not do it, trying to freak you out. He's saying these things to you. So what I'm doing is I'm externalizing anxiety. I'm taking it out of me. And I might even personify it. I might even give it a face. Sounds kind of silly, but it works. I'm going to give it a face and say, okay, that's the guy messing with me. He's saying, he's saying these things to me. So now I'm no longer struggling with myself. I have an opponent who is trying to mess with me. And my job is to not let him mess with me. I love that approach. It's... It's a difficult thing for people to do to, and I'm sure you've noticed this with, with people that you've worked with, it's a difficult thing for people to do to divorce themselves, like their self, from the thoughts they're having. Like the thoughts are a separate thing. They aren't you. You don't have to believe every one of them. They're just things that are happening. And it's a lot easier if you do what you said and flip that around and you know, word them in a way that it sounds like someone else is speaking to you and actually give them a face and a name. It's a lot easier to just wrap your mind around the fact that those thoughts aren't you when you have them characterized as someone other than you. That's great. Exactly. I love 100%. that. Because rather than having this inner struggle, now it's some opponent. I'm going to be playing a mental game with anxiety. It's going to be some opponent trying to mess with me. And... I'm not going to let him win because I have my game face on. I'm not going to let him win. So, yeah, I might be anxious and fine. I'm so fine. I'm a little anxious, but that's okay. That's fine. I'm going to do this anyways, but I'm not going to believe the, the crap that he's dishing out. So when he says, oh, you're going to be late for the plane. Well, I haven't been late for, I've never been late for the plane. Why would I be late this time? So he's just lying to me. So, no, I'm not going to believe that. Whatever. So I'm going to respond and then turn away. Anxiety is going to try to mess with me. I'm going to respond and then turn away. I don't want to engage with anxiety. What you don't want to do is engage your thoughts. So going back to the story I told before about the tunnel in Jerusalem, Hezekiah's tunnel, I began to engage in the thought. I started to imagine myself in the tunnel and what might happen. If I kept doing that, if I kept engaging with it, I would... Maybe freak myself out and not gone. If I would have thought, well, if I get stuck, what am I going to do? And I'm planning it out. I'm trying to figure. No, I'm engaging. I don't want to engage with anxiety. I'm not going to. I don't want to talk to anxiety. It's like, would you ever go to a psychic who is wrong 90% of the time and spend time sitting there? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to spend money and talk to someone who's wrong. So I'm not. I don't want to engage. I'm going to give my response and just move on. That's so actionable. I love that. How would you, from the perspective of the work that you do within uh, this field, how would you characterize being psychologically strong? What does that mean to you? I think it has to do with the courage to face fears with persistence. To be able to do things you're uncomfortable with and know that it's not going to go great the first time. I just have to be persistent with it and learn from my, you know, learn from the experience. And for people who face fears but get anxious anyways and tend to worry, they, they're more worriers than avoiders. 
It's to not engage with anxiety. When anxiety is trying to bait you into a conversation, don't take the bait. I mean, you know what happens to a fish that takes the bait. Don't take the bait. Anxiety is going to try to bait you into a conversation. Like, no, I'm not going there. I'm going to have a response and I'm going to turn away. I love that. This has been so helpful. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, anxiety is something that so many of us struggle with to varying degrees. And there's so many people who will never get to the point where it'll be debilitating enough that they'll come and see you or someone else who could help them in a professional capacity. But that just means that there's so many people out there who are just getting by and trying to find a way to live with these feelings that they could be working on and getting rid of. So I'm so appreciative of you taking the time today to share your expertise, uh, because we know that this is a topic that affects so many people and the degree to which you were able to share actionable things that we can go and do today. It was just awesome. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Happy to be here. And, uh, it's, it's such a problem that I want to be able to help as many people as I can. I love that. And actually, before I let you go, I want you to direct people to your website, to your resources, because you've got some amazing stuff up there. You mentioned it a bit at the beginning, but explicitly give people a direction about where to go, because you've got resources for people who are all along that continuum. So I have a couple websites. One is quietmindsolutions.com. And there you can find different types of products. So I have this coloring self-help book. It's a self-help book when each chapter has a coloring illustration which reinforces what you learn in the chapter. So not only are you getting the relaxation of doing some adult coloring and the mindfulness of doing this adult coloring, but you actually it reinforces what you learn. So that is a great resource. Uh, for anyone who has any sort of anxiety. And then there's what's called the Anxiety Solution Series, which is a 12-hour comprehensive uh, audio program for people who suffer with all types of anxiety disorders. You can listen to a few chapters for free on the website. You can watch some video testimonials. And um, you can download it. You can order discs, although people don't tend to do that anymore. But you can download it. Um, And then I have some relaxation exercise. I have some hypnosis sessions that people can listen to. So that's on quietmindsolutions.com. There's kengoodmantherapy.com for anyone in California who wants to do therapy with me. So that's um, there as well. And I'm part of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. I'm on the board. And that is a great resource for anyone with any sort of anxiety. There's videos and webinars and articles Go to that website, check it out, and um, there's a lot of great information there. So oh, good. And also, good. one other thing, again, I'm doing this webinar on health anxiety on uh, Saturday, December 7th, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and that will include someone who actually suffered with illness anxiety previously. So check out that webinar as well. All amazing resources. Again, Ken, thank you so much for being here. This has been so helpful. And uh, for folks listening, please do go check out his resources and put some of the tips that he gave us to use because it's amazing um, the degree to which you can shift the way that your mind works into being a very valuable asset for you rather than a liability that's holding you back from doing the things you want to do. Thanks so much, Ken. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. It's a simple fact that nearly everyone in the world could benefit from building psychological strength, but not everyone will put in the time and effort to do so, but today you did. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Building Psychological Strength. Now, if you're interested in building the mental toughness, confidence, and resilience you need to thrive through life's ups and downs, visit us at www.peakmindpsychology.com. Also, if there's someone in your life who could benefit from this episode, please share it with them. And if you yourself found this episode valuable, meaning if you took away even one insight that you can use to build psychological strength in your own life, we would so appreciate it if you would drop us a rating and a review on iTunes. The thing is, the more ratings and reviews we have, the easier it is to get this powerful and important content out to the people who need to hear it. 
Remember, your mind can be your most valuable asset or your biggest liability, and you get to choose. So choose wisely, my friend. And I'll see you next time on Building Psychological Strength.